the fact that that we've been focused on K-12, um, when we talk about education reform, everybody's focused on K-12. I, I think the Department of Education itself has traditionally been focused on K-12, and that our policies in the country about higher education are much less defined because it's been seen as the purview of the states, except for financial aid. So there hasn't been the level of strategy around trying to make higher education a critical player in economic development and economic reform from the federal level. I think the, the idea is that's been left to the states to figure out. And, and all the focus at the policy level has been on the K-12 system. So, I, so a big implication for me, and one of the reasons I'm glad that you're having this session, is that if we're going to have a real intersection between higher education and economic uh, development and economic recovery, then we have to have policy that and strategy that does that from the federal level to the states and down, and that recognizes the need to link more effectively with the private sector, and recognizes that from the federal level as well as in the states. I think it's been left, I think the role of institutions in economic recovery has kind of been left to whatever each individual college can manage to pull together with its local employers. It's kind of a you know, p uh, patchwork of local solutions with creative people working out there, but not because of anybody's a, a design of a system that could work, but in, almost in spite of it. Right. And I think that the really entrepreneurial and creative people at the local level have sort of moved into the gap where there hasn't been any uh, real policy structure or enabling, uh, there's been no enabling um, incentives or anything to help this happen. So I think the implications are that we've got to change that. We need to do a better job of aligning our K-12 and higher education sectors. They're not aligned real well right now. There are some states that are doing that better, especially in the areas of college readiness and career readiness, and we can talk a whole lot more about that. I heard Tony's metaphor about Georgetown and being a prep school, and there are those of us that used to talk about community colleges being the new graduate schools, and the reason I'll speak to that is that when you start talking about certificates and some of the difficulty we have in measuring uh, the earning power and so forth, and I sure liked your definition, Tony, that those certificates that do lead to higher earnings. About 15 to 20 percent of students going into some of our health care programs now enter with a baccalaureate degree. Folks that are entering with baccalaureate and master's degrees, and I recall being present at Brookhaven College in Texas, and we actually had students entering some of our uh, associate degree programs that already had doctorates. Mm -hmm. So how do you measure that impact? And then lastly, the thing that kind of concerns me, Duane, I um, most recently spoke at a couple of commencements in the last few days. And I don't know if any of you in the audience have ever attended a community college commencement. But you want to talk about an inspiring activity when you start to see folks that are yelling and screaming and, and they're really excited about making that move into higher education. You know, we like to consider community colleges being that own ramp to the middle class and hopefully upwards. But the opportunity to see a number of individuals whose lives have been changed, will be changed forever, and their families' lives will be changed forever, uh, certainly inspires me and tells me we have a lot to do and a whole lot of more opportunities to impact and transform some communities. But what really concerns me, though, is when I hear Tony talk about that some college aspect, folks with some college, and how do you measure that? Because the thing we don't do well, we've opened that first door of access, and we've mastered that we haven't mastered the second door of completion. And so until we start to do a better job at that, and I know a lot of us are very serious about it, we're moving in that direction, and we realize we gotta do a better job of that, but that's gonna be the key for many of our economic development, uh, uh, revitalization efforts that are going on, some other things we can do to make a difference with the social and economic changes. The power of the anecdote can be used for good and for, for ill. And certainly as a witness in front of, of legislative committees, I've, I've used those kind of anecdotes and I've had them fed back to me by the people sitting back there as a way of, of driving the, the, the policy discussion. The problem now is that a lot of the policy discussion is being driven by what I would describe as negative anecdotes. Mm -hmm. The kind of stories that, and Tony has observed, actually Tony said this and I didn't believe him so I went back and actually uh, proved it, that in every recession since 1980, 
these stories show up in the press about the PhD driving the taxi and the, the person with the college degree who's working as a, a janitor, et cetera. It's actually true. Um, thank you, Tony, for proving me <laughs> wrong. Um, and, and, but those anecdotes can be very, very powerful and in a negative way because what it does is it starts to change the arc of the conversation about what's the relative value of the investments that, that we're making. The stakes are very high, as we, as we, we said at the beginning, and, and what we're seeing is a lot of attention right now questioning the value of what these, these credentials really are in terms of, of individual economic impact and, and broader societal goals. Uh, from, from my vantage point, I think it is particularly troubling because the messaging, and frankly, uh, you know, I want to be blunt here, most of that messaging is coming from people who are highly educated, who are wealthy, who are essentially making theoretical uh, arguments. Um, that messaging is not going to be delivered to their children. It's going to be delivered to the people who are on the edge and who are trying to make what is a very difficult decision. Do I go get a job or do I go to college? What's that benefit of a college degree really going to be? And my biggest concern about the environment that we're in is that we are telling people something that they really shouldn't believe, which is that the value of a degree is declining and that it may not be worth it. In fact, as Tony pointed out, the value has declined relative to its peak. But the point is that uh, compared to anything else, having a post-secondary credential is a prerequisite. It is uh, uh, something that will be the umbrella in the storm in order to help you be successful. Or to put it more bluntly, absent the credential, your chances of being poor are very high. So that message is the message that I think that we've got to deliver to consumers and to the public. And we've got to walk the walk when it comes to the public policy work. So it's not only providing the kinds of support that we do through tutoring and counseling and mentoring, through TRIO and Gear Up and those kinds of efforts. That's, that's an absolute uh, essential. But we've also got to get real about the incentives that we have in institutional support and student support that focus on the completion agenda that, that, that Walter was talking about. We've got to make clear that as important as access is, we are not done until those individuals have achieved a high quality credential. And the incentives in state policy for, for institutions to do a better job at graduating, particularly those low income minority and first generation students and adults that we need to drive our economy is going to become very important. We need incentives in student financial aid, institutional aid, state aid, federal aid that focus on creating those encouragements to complete the credential and actually get out there and, and be successful. But that's the arc of the conversation that I think we've got to collectively push and that I think at a policy level we've got to deliver on through, through the, the state and federal policy efforts. Is this, in fact, all, uh, all degrees are created equal? Education in whatever form is good for you. You should get as much of it as you can. Uh, and the policy uh, that we should be pursuing is trying to find as many resources as we can and pouring it into the system to try to grow it. Or is it, in fact, do we, in fact, need to start thinking differently about what people are studying, what people are learning, and what these learning outcomes are uh, that as it relates to where they're going to go past education, specifically into employment. How should we think about that? I think we already do have a system that is tied uh, loosely to uh, labor markets to begin with. That is, uh, if you look at the current distribution of majors, 10% are liberal arts, and that's being uh, somewhat generous, actually. Literally, liberal arts majors are more like 4%. But if you add in humanities and some other things, it's 10 percent. And in that group, uh, when you look at those people, where they go, because we did look at the occupations and industries they entered and moved through from age 25 to uh, 65, uh, what you find is they go to pretty relatively predictable places. If they don't get a graduate degree, they go into education, government, they go into management and non-technical industries, uh, sales, uh, and so on. Um, but in the case of liberal arts, what happens is 41% uh, of them go on and get graduate degrees, and that's the point at which they put an occupational point on their education pencil. 
uh, and that's what moves them into the higher wage categories. We also know uh, that when you look at selective colleges, um, uh, liberal arts uh, graduates, that they go on to graduate school in much higher proportions uh, than students who take liberal arts at less selective colleges. So the formula that works the best is go to Harvard, get a liberal arts degree, and become uh, 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 and become, God help us, a petroleum engineer, but, but you could also become, because that's the best one, but you could also become any number of other things. Uh, so the, uh, the system has, I think, it is an occupational system. I think we're fooling ourselves to say it isn't. And the occupations themselves do require broader skills. Skills and jobs are no longer about turning bolts so that uh, the fact that technology automates uh, repetitive mental and physical tasks means that all jobs are bundles of tasks that are more and more non-repetitive. That's what the employers are really telling us when they keep saying uh, we're not getting what we, they, we need. And I think, I mean, our data bears them out, at least since the 1980s. We ha they haven't been getting what they need. So there is a, um, there's a, f you know, uh, there is the value of learning beyond uh, its economic value, and I do think that that to some extent is at risk. Uh, there is a value to learning that is general and has nothing to do, I suspect, uh, with whether or not you can perform on the job. Uh, it's more about learning for its own sake, which is an American value, self-improvement. There is a value of learning that's more about the culture and living fully in your times. Uh, that value, I suspect, uh, already increasingly goes to people who have the ability to pay uh, and increasingly doesn't go uh, to people who go to public institutions, who I which I think are falling away a bit, uh, and are more and more focused on occupational preparation. So uh, in the end, I think we already are an occupational system. Uh, it's just that some people get more general education and more choice in occupations than others do. We've been engaged in this, in this uh, debate now for many years, which I really think is a false dichotomy, which is are we training people for jobs or are we training them for life? And the reality is we are doing both. And the fact that higher education has been slow, although I, I, I want to acknowledge that it, that it, is, it is coming around uh, to, to the understanding that in fact, training people for jobs and training people for life is the same thing the same skills that you need to be successful as an effective participant in our, in our democracy, to be a good parent, uh, et cetera, are the same skills that you need to be effective in a job, and that is the ability to communicate, to think critically, to be analytical, to solve problems. Those are all things you get, or you should get, out of any credential you get at any post-secondary institution. So the, the credentials are really designed to do two things, or should be designed to do two things. The first is deliver those generalizable skills irrespective of the field of study. And the second is to deliver specific content knowledge in the area that you're studying. The question for the economist is what's the relative value of the two? And I think that's one that, that we're going to talk about and debate for, for a long period of time. But again, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, both are critically important. And I think to end up with that conversation where, this false, where there's this false dichotomy, I think is particularly dangerous. The second point is, I think, um, to have a better understanding of where those generalizable skills are actually learned. They're often not learned in the general education classes. They are learned in these specific, highly content-driven classes where you learn how to write, uh, where you learn how to do a presentation, where you, where you, where you are actually participating in a peer-based dialogue, et cetera. Those generalizable skills come up as much in a you know in an advanced chemistry class as they do in in a, in a general ed course, and I think that we've got to uh, create better understanding of that that those skills for jobs and for life are in fact the same thing. I was struck by the question the young lady asked over here about how do you train uh, some of the workers to have better <coughs> communication skills to write better, and that's a question I used to get a lot from the governor of Louisiana and from some of the business leaders, and I think Jamie's right on point uh, about a false dichotomy. But at the end of the day, uh, Dwayne, I think we've learned a lot in terms of uh, some of the research that's been done in this area. My good friend and colleague, Kay McClinney, whom some of you may know in the room, uh, she's the 
uh, executive director of an organization called SESI, but she likes to talk about the fact students don't do optional very well. And, uh, and I, I tend to agree with her on that. But I think what we've done is we've created perhaps too many alternatives for some of our students in terms of programs. And I think we need to do a better job of creating systems that lead to student success at the end of the day and hopefully have uh, students at least in community colleges who are being equally well trained whether they're pursuing a, uh, an associate's degree on the pathway to a baccalaureate degree or they're going right into the world of work. And, and in my uh, opinion, we certainly have to be mindful of the costs, and you're exactly right when you start to talk about uh, some of our health care programs. I used to call some of those programs and some of the other technical programs uh, a race with no finish line because you really might not have enough money to really do them all and do them well. So with limited resources, especially with state budgets the way they are, I think college leaders and, and others uh, – from a policy standpoint, are going to really have to determine in their given communities, they can't have duplicate programs, they've got to have great programs, and programs that really lead either to successful transfer or to the world of work. There's been so much discussion about the economic return to degrees uh, for the employer, for, for the helping the economy, and there's not been enough focus on the public good created by higher education degrees, which used to be discussed at great length, you know, not just civic participation, but all the other benefits that accrue to the society for having a more educated workforce and citizenry. And I think we've lost a lot of that focus in our relentless look at who makes more money and what are your lifetime earnings returns, et cetera. So I, I think it has tended to push policymakers in the direction of saying higher ed degrees are a private good. They just accrue to the individual, so the individual should pay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has allowed uh, our, us to move away from public support of higher education. So that, that has concerned me. But I, I guess I would just also want to add that, you know, though higher ed is loosely tied to the labor market, in fact, individuals that we counsel, and we counsel tens of thousands of adults every year, um, particularly adult workers, they, they are desperate for very specific information about the labor market. What, what degree should I pursue? How do I retrain? What career? They don't have much time left. Um, they don't, we do not have inside of our institutions sophisticated information on career navigation and resources for the people that we're serving. Um, I, I'll give you just one quick example. We, we just completed a website for the telecommunications industry on all of the different careers and jobs available in the entire telecom industry, uh, including information technology, and how you move from one to the other and what education you need for each. And when people come to that website, young people, older adults, what they say is, this is the first time I've understood uh, that there are 50 or 60 jobs that I didn't even know existed and that there are training and educational programs for that I don't know about. And nobody at my institution tells me this or helps me with this. Where do I go to school? How do I pursue the right programs? We need that information more than ever in this very complex labor market. And our, our colleges don't have it and they're not able to provide it, and our career counseling units are some of the weakest pieces of our institutions. So I think if we're going to be more tied to the labor market, we've got to also beef up our ability to assist people in those areas. In these August halls, I can sense the weight of decisions, weighty decisions <laughs> being made all around us. And so the question is this. Here we are in Washington. Um, this is the, nation, the nation's capital. We have federal policy being made all around us as we speak. Uh, we have a lot of stuff coming up in the next couple of years that impact on these issues. Uh, ESEA reauthorization, ultimately the re reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, WEA reauthorization, uh, hearings already taking place on workforce policy and, and uh, what the options are there. Um, what do you see as the implications specifically, if you wish to suggest them, of all of these issues we've been talking about for federal policy? if you focused on the Workforce Investment Act first, and I hope it can get reauthorized and changed. I mean, it's been put off and put off, so I hope that we actually do see it. Um, there are a number of problems with it that make it very difficult for higher education and the workforce system to collaborate and for uh, people with special needs to be served. 
And so uh, the, the kinds of things that need to be changed, I've spoken before about these, the common measures that are written into the Workforce Investment Act are extremely problematic for older workers, anyone with any particular challenges to employment. Um, and, and, you know, we created it in 1998. WIO was created in 1998 in a full employment situation. And now we've got measures that just don't work. Uh, they don't work across regions. They, the, the, um, the average wages that were negotiated between the United States Department of Labor and the states are too high for this economy. There's just a lot of problems with it. But specifically, it makes it impossible for people to be placed in part-time work while and, and go to school. It makes it uh, very difficult to invest in incumbent worker training, the current law. Um, there, there are many disincentives to assisting people with counseling and longer-term education and training written right into the law and the way it's regulated. So if we were going to try to change the Workforce Investment Act specifically, that it just, just tackle that one issue, we would have to remove those disincentives and further uh, a lot, uh, encourage and incentivize the workforce system to work with our colleges. Mm -hmm because there are lots of in, uh, places around the country where um, uh, they are working at cross purposes, the colleges on the one hand and the workforce boards and systems on the other. And I think that we could eliminate that with some careful uh, rethinking of the incentive structure uh, that, would, that would also reward placement, placement of workers in longer term training and education, which would lead to meaningful credentials and long term employment. So if I just took, that's just the Workforce Investment Act. There are many other implications on the higher ed side that could also be discussed and maybe there'll be time for that. I just want to make one quick observation uh, as to your question. Of course, as you know, as the president of a private foundation, I'm unable to comment on active <laughs> legislation. <laughs> Yes. Um, so you will be providing nonpartisan so research. Nonpartisan research and analytic advice. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, look, I, I, I've been involved in these issues for a long time at, at a policy level. And one observation I would have about federal policy is uh, federal policy is the tortoise, and uh, increasingly the world is the hare. And we really have a problem with the ability of federal policy to maintain pace with the changes that we're experiencing educationally, economically, and socially. And a good example would be Pam's lament about WIA. I got bad news for you, Pam. It took us 10 years to reauthorize the Higher Ed Act last time. Uh, it was supposed to take five. Um, and I think that's just a sort of small indicator of the challenge that we face. We have serious jurisdictional issues among committees. We have the way in which the history and tradition of these laws are written, WIA, ESCA, Higher Ed Act, uh, not to mention tax policy, which I think is enormously important uh, and probably is going to grow in importance over, over the next decade. These are issues that we, ha we have to confront on a sort of intermediate term trajectory, which is to have a serious conversation about what are we trying to accomplish en masse with these policies and structures that we have in place. Because a single lever, pulling a single lever is not going to create the big policy change that we want. We have to think of these things in the aggregate. Students don't live in Higher Ed Act programs or WIA programs or ESEA programs. They live in the real world and these are all inputs. These are all, these are all uh, things that they are dealing with within their life. And we've got to figure out a different way to have the macro conversation, so that, that, that's one point. The second point is we've got to have a hard conversation because of the economic climate and, and the budget situation at the, in the federal level about what the priorities really are and how to best utilize the, utilize the resources we do have to achieve the high impacts that we all expect out of these programs. And we're going to break some China along the way in having those kind of conversations. But I think absent that, absent the kind of, of big impacts on moving the needle on increasing degree attainment, I think we are going to lose the public policy debate about the value of higher education. That is, I fear that absent the results that, that we think are necessary, dramatic improvements in degree attainment for Latinos and African Americans and low-income people, significant learning outcomes that we can demonstrate, et cetera, I think that we are going to, to really lose the, the public policy environment, and I think the country will be the, the worse off for it. I think the context here is, is uh, extremely hostile um, and there will be major change. 
Um, and everything, what strikes me is that I agree with everybody uh, that there is a mission here that sits between the Department of Labor and the Department of Education, but there is no institution there. I mean, you have to sit somewhere out on the mall. Um, so, and there are cultural differences between the two. I've been a creature of both. Uh, and it's, I, I'm half Irish, half Italian, and I know uh, which, which grandparents I'm with uh, makes a big difference. The, um, so I think the, uh, I think in radical format, I think if this is still where they do the budget stuff over here, I have a feeling that in this room they will zero out WIA sometime in the next year. Uh, I'm almost, if I, were, if I were still working here, the Democrats would do that. Um, the one thing you can do with that is you can then make a deal, uh, that is we, uh, to a large extent, is the seed of it failed. Uh, we thought we were gonna build an education and training system connected to work in the Department of Labor. We started that out in the uh, Carter administration, the most robust way with CETA, and if we were still funding WIA the way we funded CETA, WIA would be $25 billion. Uh, it's about three or four. I would take the three or four uh, and turn it into um, counseling and information that connects education uh, and work, try to use it to leverage states to take on that role, because I think having the Fed do that nationwide is just unnecessary stress for everybody politically, uh, and uh, build a bunch of programs around it. The question is what would be the institutional mechanism? I think you'd need to either create something in the education department, although I must say that makes me nervous because it might be swallowed up by the education department culture and they won't get serious about jobs. Um, so I'd say keep it, make it a separate uh, non-governmental en entity. The old National Commission for Employment Policy was a creature of the Congress that served this purpose. I was the last chair, it was defunded. Um, so I think, um, yeah, well, it's a lifelong <laughs> ambition to restore it. Uh, anyway, the, um, the, uh, I think that there, that sort of thinking needs to occur. Uh, we've got to find some way to connect these things. Uh, the second thing, uh, that occurs to me uh, in the, the medium term in all this is that there is a missing voice in this conversation and we now need it. Uh, this legislative voice has been checkmated, that is there's not much room to move here, not much room to move on the administration side for administrations that want to get reelected. There are hard budget issues. Uh, politics is greatly constrained. Uh, there is an, an air of inevitability in everybody's mind about this. We all love education, but we know we're going to cut it anyway. It's inevitable. The question is, who does it? Um, the, uh, I think that it, the only way you get that air of inevitability challenged is from another part of our system, and that's the courts. And what we've seen lately in New Jersey, that is, they've challenged their governor because he wants to move money out of low-income schools, they said he can't do it, it's unconstitutional because they have adequacy uh, standards in the state constitution, virtually all states have them. Uh, so I think we've forgotten the courts. Now the national courts won't do much for us, they've got votes against education. Uh, state courts are a different animal and state constitutions are different animals.
the public that we have to actually totally reinvent. And we can't do it with, without business and some here and here and here. It goes for America. We've got education and, and the workforce have to work together, which I think, you know, looking at what degrees really mean, essential. I, I know my question is hard to answer about silos, and if we have the answer, we'd be doing sure. No, you know, I, I'm just thinking about, um, I mean, I don't have any, any answer. I'm just thinking about, um, this, this, uh, the two cultures of the two departments that Tony was talking about, and those are those are not only culture differences, but governed by different legislation and different imperatives, and um, and when high impact programs do get developed, uh, for example, uh, in higher education, all of these uh, innovations that we see, such as competency based programs, prior learning assessment for adults. Um, uh, even um, accelerated degree programs, the things that will help both employers and workers proceed more quickly to degrees. Um, so, so everybody's in support of these ideas. And then over here, the Inspector General's office in the Department of Education <coughs> introduces new regulations that will put a chilling effect on all those innovations and make it very difficult for legitimate institutions to actually carry out these innovations, such as online learning in, in multiple states and with multiple employers. Uh, and so even, I guess what I'm saying is, even when you do get innovation in one of the silos, high impact innovation in one of the silos, yet even, it doesn't always, the silo problem doesn't always have to come from another agency. It can come from within your own agency. And I, when I see, when I f have followed the, all these discussions about the impact of these, just this little set of regulations on the credit hour, on uh, registration of online programs, gainful employment, while they were designed to try to prevent <coughs> abuse, the effect of the, these regulations is going to be to hamper high impact innovations that very high quality institutions are trying to do. And so what I, what I often find is that um, things get introduced at federal policy levels because of maybe not having the connection to what's really happening out in the field and on the ground. And I wonder how do we, how do we prevent some of these um, misguided uh, uh, policy regulatory efforts so we can allow for the innovation to occur that we really need. And I, I, we have 700 member institutions who care about adult learners. They're terribly upset about this, just as one example. They're, they're at their wit's end as to what to do about it. And so the same thing occurs on the Department of Labor side. Constraints are put onto uh, states and local boards that nobody intended to hamper their innovation, but it actually works in that way. So I think the difference between what happens up here at the macro policy level and what happens to the people trying to implement programs on the ground, that is where the disconnect seems to occur. And it feels as if there needs to be somehow more communication up uh, to the people who make policy at a macro level. So I'm just very concerned about some of these, some of these issues that, w that our institutions and program directors are facing.